So today we're gonna to talk about nutri nutrition and supplements for anxious kids and teens. And a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today applies more than just to kids with anxiety. It applies to just about every kid. I also work a lot with kids who have ADHD and nutrition is so important in that context too. But as we know, nutrition is very important in every context. Um, just a little introduction. I am Dr. Mary Wild. I am an integrative or holistic pediatrician focused especially on anxiety and ADHD and finding evidence-based natural solutions to improve the lives of kids who struggle with these things. I am a mom, I'm an author, I'm a TEDx speaker, I'm a podcaster, so I've done a lot of things because I feel so passionate about sharing a message and helping families understand that there are more options when it comes to optimizing their kids' emotional wellness. So this is a picture of my family. I have eight boys. This is a couple years old, but my oldest son is 23 and my youngest is seven, so that's the range. So I've really spent the majority of my, you know, grown up life as a parent and navigating a lot of the same issues that you navigate. And it's been very enriching to have a background in pediatrics and behavioral health and bioindividual nutrition. And it's really blessed me in my family and parenting experience. So today we'll talk first about the foundations. And then we'll talk about the power of an integrative approach, then how nutrition supports emotional wellness. Then I'll share with you some of my favorite supplements that help optimize nutrition in general and specifically are therapeutic for various emotional um, struggles. And then we'll talk about some therapeutic diets. I want to start out with this quote from my colleague, Dr. Nicole Birkins, and we have presented at some similar events, but I really love what she says. She says, I wish I'd known earlier in my career that if a child is not sleeping well at night, eating a nutrient poor diet, not getting fresh air and sunshine, not getting enough physical activity, living or schooling in a chronically high stress environment, then no amount of psychotherapy, behavioral therapy, or educational interventions or other therapies will provide significant benefit. And I think what she's getting at here is just the idea that the foundations really have to be in place for us to get optimal benefit from any kind of therapeutic that we are doing. Let's just talk really quick about sleep. I remember reading in a textbook of my husband's. My hu husband teaches parenting and family science at the university. But there is this paragraph that I loved. It said something like, newsflash, revolutionary free treatment can improve mood, focus, memory, immune function, energy, weight management, and heart health. And, um, and then it was of course saying, this is sleep. But even though we, you know, all kind of know this in the back of our minds. We don't always act like we know this. We don't always prioritize sleep. And so this is one of the first places to look when our kids are struggling with their behavior. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends nine to 12 hours of sleep for six to 12 year olds and eight to 10 hours for teens. And I know so many of the kids in my clinic and sometimes my own kids haven't been able to muster that many hours of sleep. and there are so many pressures, but it is so important to prioritize this. And this is a lesson I sometimes need to tell myself because I am one of those moms who's trying to burn the midnight oil and get lots of things done or wake up really early before my kids wake up. But we can kid ourselves for a while that it's not affecting us, but it really does. Physical activity. Physical activity is also so important. Dr. John Rady in his book, Spark, 
said, going for a run is like taking a little bit of Prozac and a little bit of Ritalin at every level from the microcellular to the physiological exercise not only wards off the ill effects of chronic stress, it can also reverse them. And I really love this reminder that there's so many things that are available to us um, as um, resources and um, and go to kind of treatments that we don't have to get a prescription for, we don't have to research about, we can just go and do them. They're just right at our disposal. So I'm going to stop sharing just for a second because I don't think I can let people into my Zoom room when I'm sharing screen. So I'm going to stop just for a second and then um, just check if there are people waiting and then run back into the share. There we go. We're going to go back into the share. So, oops. And now finally, wise technology use. It's just startling to me that it's, some research shows that the average screen time among teen, teens is seven and a half hours a day. And this does not include schoolwork. And I hope that's not the average at your house, but I think that this is very troubling. And while there are mixed studies, many studies show that there are increased rates of depression and anxiety with increased technology use, but it is acknowledged that some of this might be kind of cyclical, like which comes first, our kids um, you know, going to their screens for solace when they already feel anxious and depressed, or are they getting anxious and depressed because they're focusing so much on screens and missing out on certain face-to-face -face interactions? Um, but whatever the studies show, I see the effects of overuse of technology in my family at times, in my clinic, and so I think just common sense tells us we need to be wise about this. Of course, not all screen time is created equally. And one thing to think about is, you know, when we're trying to find the right balance and the right um, boundaries to set, to think about what sleep, physical activity, and social interactions are being displaced by the, um, the screen time that your child is, is engaging in. One, website that I really like, I put here on the bottom of the slide, is cyberwise.org. And it focuses on, um, on the fact that we need to be aware, we have to be more aware as parents at the things that our kids are seeing, and we have to train our kids to be good citizens in this digital universe. So it's a really good resource, and they have some free parenting resources there. Now let's get into nutrition. That is the main thing that we were wanting to talk about today, but I just had to throw in the other foundational things. But food is medicine. A healthy diet supports energy, mood, and focus because it gives us the building blocks that we need for everything that we do. They have found that in um, mood disturbances like anxiety, depression, that sometimes there are deficiencies in zinc, vitamin D, iron, B vitamins, omega-3s, magnesium, selenium, and other things. And I have a friend who's a compounding pharmacist and, and he studies nutrition a lot. And he talks about how people don't talk about the fact that a lot of the prescription medicines actually lead to deficiencies. And so it's really important, especially if your child is taking a prescription medicine, that they have their nutrition really um, solid. It's interesting that, you know, a lot of times we think we're doing okay, you know, we try to put an apple in our kids' lunch, we try to have something green at dinner, but really the, the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables is seven to 13 servings, and a serving is like a, a, a fist size. The CDC estimates that only one in 10 people get enough fruits and vegetables. And the saying goes that you cannot out 
supplement a poor diet that really a lot of supplements don't even get absorbed if the nutrition foundation isn't there. So nutrition is so important. So in my clinical practice, in my online programs, I take an integrative approach to anxiety. And this is also with ADHD or any kind of emotional disturbance or behavioral issue. It's not just therapy or medication that can help us, yet that is often the go-to and, and sometimes the only thing that providers recommend. But all these things on this list have been shown to be helpful in anxiety. Um, yes, cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful. It can be very helpful, but there's also mindfulness, mindfulness and imagery. Medication can help, but it just affects brain chemistry. Um, there is also the rest of the body <laughs> that affects our mood. And so we can use things like breathing, physical activity, yoga, aromatherapy, grounding with our five senses, lifestyle factors, tapping, um, and of course, nutrition, like we're talking about. Then there's also the spiritual aspect that I think too many people ignore that religious or spiritual practices can help us have a sense of well being. We can do things like journaling, um, be supported by study of wisdom literature or inspiring quotes. We can express ourselves and gain uplift through the arts, music, and the fine arts. We can benefit by doing service. It kind of gets us out of ourselves and help, helps us have um, a sense of purpose and meaning. Gratitude practices are so powerful. Time in nature, relationships, laughter. So often our anxious kids are going from one activity to another and they are not taking time to do the things that they feel so um, uplifted by just so uniquely. So it's really important to keep in mind all these things. One thing that I think is important to bring up is that though we often have um, really relied a lot on therapy and medication, historically, you know, um, anxiety is not just one thing. Depression is not just one thing. And sometimes um, the, the studies talk about it as if it is. And more recently, there have been studies coming out and meta-analyses showing that maybe antidepressants aren't as helpful as we once thought. So antidepressants, SSRIs, are often first-line treatment for anxiety as well as depression in kids. Um, and I think it is really important to acknowledge that prescription medications can be very, very important. It can be life-saving, especially in severe situations. And I do prescribe antidepressant medications. I do prescribe stimulant medications for ADHD, but I don't think they have to be the first approach and the first line treatment for everybody. There are some common side effects from SSRIs, for example, it can affect sleep, it can affect appetite and, um, and sexual dysfunction, which we often don't think about for kids, but sometimes kids get on these medicines and then they just like don't get off of them. And so it may be an issue later. Then there's some more rare but severe side effects where it causes like intense aggression, hallucinations, very profound emotional numbing. So, you know, it's taking down a perception of one emotion, but it kind of takes down other emotions as well. Some people have described this as kind of living in a colorless world, and it's hard to feel motivated and attached to um, you know, the activities you're doing when you feel emotionally numb. And some people have worsened symptoms, but most people, you know, don't have these things, but it's just, I think, important to acknowledge that they're, you know, starting every kid who is anxious on an SSRI or every kid who has ADHD on a stimulant might not be the best idea. It's not just um, 
a totally benign thing to do. Um, particularly for SSRIs, it's not a medication that you can just like stop. You have to do some tapering. And so you do need to be working with a medical professional. So here are a couple different studies that kind of show that there's this debate. They have recently looked at many studies and, and found that sometimes people who have been taking medicines actually like maybe it helps one thing, but it doesn't overall give them a greater quality of life. Or, you know, we often have talked about, oh, it's all serotonin, anxiety and depression. It's all just serotonin not being available to the brain. But they're, they've called this this into question as they've looked at the research and they say that we don't know exactly. And also anxiety and depression really are multifactorial. So that's why I think it's really important to look at some of these um, more everyday layperson approaches to emotional wellness through nutrition. So why would nutrition affect our emotional wellness? First of all, we have, you know, uh, not only does our brain produce serotonin and other neurotransmitters, but our gut also does too. And so sometimes our emotional health is very related to our gut health and more and more research is coming out about this each year also there's a question of epigenetics epigenetics is saying that um, we have a dna sequence we have our genes but the environment that we are in dictates how these genes are turned on and off so we can affect these things by how much sleep we get, how much stress we are exposed to, and so, and, and how, how healthy our diet is. So it's really important to see that nutrition is a intervention point. So here I have a little picture of some bacteria saying, feed us. So sometimes we have, um, gut dysbiosis, um, we have an overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria in our, in our gut. And really it's our bacteria ecosystem that informs the cravings that we have. So if we are eating really unhealthy foods, then we continue to crave those unhealthy foods. And a healthier gut biome is supported by healthier nutrition. And so in some ways we can kind of blame some of our bad habits on the bacteria that lives in our gut, but through our bad habits, we continue to invite less healthy bacteria into our gut. So some of the biggest problems with the modern diet are that it's high carb process. There are tons of additives and preservatives that our body doesn't know how to process efficiently. Um, in this little cartoon on the side, it says psychotherapy with diet modification. And the therapist is saying, so the happy meal didn't work. I like that. I know it's kind of blurry on this on the slide, but a happy meal does not make us happy. Um, there's also de decreased nutritional content in the food that we often purchase at the grocery store, it's, it's picked early, the soil is depleted, it's been traveling for, for miles and miles and miles, and it's just not at the peak of its nutritional value. Also, as we talked about before, it's just hard to get in as many fruits and vegetables as we want. And really the phytonutrients, the, the nutrients we get from plants is really the basic aspect of a healthy diet, but only one in 10 of us are getting enough. So I think it's important to acknowledge that we, you know, the, the recommended daily allowances and the, the recommended servings of fruits and vegetables keeps going up, partly because our food supply is getting depleted. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that athletes need even more because there's more of this oxidative process going on. 
a lot of times we think, oh, well, I take a multivitamin, so I'm fine. But really multivitamins have, are only isolating a handful of the things that are found in food. And you can look at a list of phytonutrients in an apple and it's like 10,000 as opposed to, you know, maybe the 15 to 20 isolated things that are on a multivitamin label. So I do think many vitamins are great, but it doesn't necessarily cover us in the same way that whole food supplementation does. So, um, and some supplements, there's, there's no data that they actually are getting absorbed. You know, we don't know that they are actually dissolving as they, tr you know, go through our intestinal system. And so I think having a well-researched product is very important. This is just one study that was put out that compared one bowl of spinach from the 1950s to um, about 43 bowls of spinach in 2000, that the, the nutritional content has gone down that much. And I think that that's pretty crazy. They don't have new data after the year 2000, but not super um, comforting. So what is the solution? I am not a super extremist, you know, um, nutritional person. Like I, I let my family have some sugar. We do homemade treats. Um, we don't necessarily never let ourselves have a bag of chips, but we do it rarely. And I think that we can think of the continuum of good, better, best. You know, maybe we're not willing to completely take some of these things out of our diet, but to at least decrease the amount of processed junk foods um, and thing and additives that we're putting in our body is an improvement, making just like one small change. Also eating a healthy balanced diet of nutrient rich foods and the Mediterranean diet is, you know, has been shown to be very representative of like a lot of plants, some good healthy fats, some proteins. And so I like to look at the Mediterranean diet as an example. But a lot of our kids are not having healthy balanced diets. I know that I have a couple of kids who have done football and they talk about bulking. They do a lot of high protein meals and lots of high calorie kind of at any cost, but it's creating terrible eating habits. And so many of these kids, they are taking in so many calories for protein and carbs and fats that they're just like not even hungry for a salad because they don't see that that's a bulking item. And so that's really problematic when you think about the fact that most football players do not go on to be professional football players necessarily, but yet they probably carry this poor diet and then vastly decrease their um, physical activity. And it just is not, you know, a good road. So I love the idea of whole food supplementation. And sometimes when, you know, there's still issues then we can consider therapeutic diets, which I'll just touch upon at the end. So my favorite whole food supplement is one called Juice Plus. And I, you know, am very hesitant to put my name with a product, but there are some that I have seen that really impress me and Juice Plus is one of those. And so this is the link you can use if you want to get more information about it, it's capital bit.ly, capital Dr. Mary, lowercase whole, because it is a whole food supplement. And if you have any questions about it, you can message me or tag me in your comments and we can get on a call and I can help you put in the order such that you can get buy one, get one free for a parent and child. Because I love how this company not only supports kids health but also the whole family health. I also love it because 
the idea that we need to suddenly, you know, get like five more servings of fruits and vegetables a day is kind of a big jump from what a lot of our, us are doing and it's hard to make the change. It's been said that changing your diet is like learning a new language and it's not easy. So this is a wonderful bridge. It's powdered fruits and vegetables and it's one of the most highly studied, I think the most highly studied nutraceutical on the market. It's organic, vegan, NSF certified. So NSF certified is like better than organic saying there's nothing else in this product than what is claimed to be there. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, so this is a, a little picture in this hand of what the capsules look like. There's a fruit, vegetable, and berry powder. And then there are some um, omegas that are completely plant-based. So it's wonderful. And, and really there are a few contraindications to this. And this is one thing, like I try to be very conservative to make a recommendation because you think, well, I don't wanna make a blanket recommendation for everybody and what if it's not good for a certain person but this is like one thing that I feel comfortable recommending to just about anybody the you know the contraindication would be if you have an anaphylactic allergic reaction to one of the ingredients then I would avoid it of course but actually some people who have had just um very mild reactions like maybe like an itchy itchiness in their mouth when they eat kiwi or strawberries or something like that um, i have seen them be able to tolerate this and some allergists actually use it because it's that like micro exposure that helps um, actually decrease allergy in some cases so i have had some clients who have actually been able to tolerate this when they have some food intolerances because it can go in in the capsule form and they're able to get in their fruits and vegetables this way. So anyway, I'm just going to show you another picture of it. This is how um, the bottles look. They have a, a capsule, which really is superior to the chewables, which are gummies, because you can never get as much nutrition in a gummy, but it's still available for those kids who cannot swallow a capsule or who will not tolerate having the capsule opened and sprinkled but i will say that my kids they they sometimes swallow the capsules like even my seven-year-old he's like look i can do it in one swallow you know but but also he opens it and mixes it in water and and just drinks it so it's not it's not bad um so the chewables the gummies are about like a quarter of the nutrient density compared to the capsules, but still better than nothing for sure. Um, I will say that the the berry product has um, green tea powder, so it has some natural caffeine in it. And so that could be good for some people who are looking for an energy boost, but for other people, they might not want that or might not want their kids to have that like before bed. So that's a good thing to know about. But anyway, here are some pictures of some journals that um, studies about Juice Hut Plus have been published in, and it's like over 40 journals. It is amazing. So I think in general, when you're trying to find a supplement, it's good to look for clinical data. So many products are out there that have a lot of testimonials, but just because it worked for Aunt Marge doesn't mean it is going to work for you and it doesn't mean that it is like high quality or effective it's really important to go for high quality supplements from well-known brands and buy directly from the source um, a lot of things can be purchased on amazon but there have been cases where people actually just relabel things and put their own whatever in and kind of become the middleman and um that's not a chance that I personally want to take. So also I know a lot of families, they start a bunch of supplements and then they're like, oh, well, all these things are a good idea. And, um, you know, I don't really feel different. And, you know, some of it is 
preventative. So sometimes we won't feel different, but especially if you're on a therapeutic agent, this goes for a medication, like a prescription or a therapeutic supplement, then you should notice a difference. Otherwise it's probably not worth taking. Um, often noticing a difference, research shows equals kind of like a 10% difference. So um, sometimes with the more proactive preventative things, you won't feel a difference, but a lot of families actually do. And there have been studies done with, for example, the Juice Plus powders that kids who consistently take them have fewer visits to the doctor, fewer antibiotics, fewer missed school days. And also, this is one of the amazing things about it, nobody is proposing that families just like swallow these capsules and stop eating fruits and vegetables. It's more of just something to bridge the gap. And most kids who actually start taking the supplements start eating more fruits and vegetables. And the reason this is, is because of metabolic reprogramming that um, when we are feeding the healthy bacteria, that's the bacteria that starts influencing our cravings. And so often, you know, you make one healthy choice and some other things start falling into line as well. I think with any um, supplement, it's important to look at the risks and benefits or any prescription too. Um, you know, taking fruit and vegetables in a capsule seems pretty safe in general, you know. Um, other things that have ingredients you maybe don't know about or that where there are mixed studies um, then I would be a little more hesitant. Um, it's important to think about how reasonable are the claims that these people are making? How transparent are they? Are, are they willing to actually talk about what's in it? Can I read a label? Um, and it's worth just trying something for a limited time and seeing how you like it, especially if the, the possibility for benefit is great and the risk is low. And I think it's really important to share with your healthcare providers if you are on supplements, because I know that um, a lot of people feel a little sheepish to tell their pediatricians, oh, and I'm taking this herbal remedy and I'm taking that and I'm, but your doctors want to know. The thing is that a lot of them don't know a lot about um, more holistic supplements or um, nutrition but some do and it's important for them to know because some things can interact with prescription medications. So, but I was talking with this, um, my friend, the compounding pharmacist, and we were talking about how a lot of times people have the idea that natural equals safe and that's not always the case. So natural doesn't always equal safe and we still have to be, you know, discriminating and really look for a product that, that has, has data behind it. So besides this natural doesn't equal safe, um, there are other pitfalls. So, you know, we look at 100% natural on a label and think, oh, but that there's no, no um, legal definition really of natural. And so people, anyone can claim natural. You can't claim organic, you can't claim NSF certified, but you can say natural and it doesn't really mean that much. Um, also testimonials don't equal research, but testimonials can be important. I like to look at some reviews of real people who have taken certain prescription medications or for certain supplements and hear how their experience has been. And um, the supplements that I recommend, you know, one reason I've chosen to recommend them is because I have very strongly seen benefits. So it is important to recognize that the FDA does not regulate the supplement, supplement industry. So good companies do have certain checks like third parties that, um, you know, confirm the purity of their products and things like that. Um, so I think that's just good to be aware of. So now, you know, I talked about a nutritional supplement and just getting your nutrition right in general can help overall health in very powerful ways. 
Um, it can give us more energy. It can give us um, a healthier gut biome in general. But also then there's a different step, like one step beyond to actually do something therapeutic. And I think if your child is struggling with something specific like mood or focus, then sometimes in addition to just basic nutrition, then a therapeutic might be needed, which could be a prescription, which could be skill-based training and strategies, or it could be a supplement. So my favorite kind of all-in-one therapeutic agent for anxiety and ADHD type situations where we're wanting just a little help with mood and a little help with emotional regulation and focus. I really like this product by Amari and I'll show you a picture in just a second. It has a probiotic, a prebiotic, it has herbs and amino acids, and it's it's pretty palatable. It It is like stirred into a drink and a little pixie stick and a chewable tablet. So kids who can't swallow pills can do this. Um, it does have some sweetness to it, but they use xylitol, which is considered one of the healthier sweeteners. And there are some different alternatives for older kids and teens. So if you have any, if you have an interest in this product and you want to talk about, oh, what would be the best approach to start with, then I think it's important to maybe get on a call and talk about it a little bit. But this, you know, with this and with everything, I am not acting as your provider. I'm just sharing generalized information that I'm just saying, oh, in general, I recommend this. Um, and in general, for an older kid, I would recommend this. And in general. So I do want to make that disclaimer. But um, almost any therapeutic agent where you start getting like herbs or amino acids or other um, ingredients that are supposed to have some kind of effect, there is the chance for interaction with other medications. So this product, this Amari product can be taken with ADHD medications. Um, it should be thought about before mixing it with like a SSRI or an antidepressant because it has effects that can increase some of those neurotransmitters too. So you don't want to like double up and be doing multiple things at once without knowing what you're doing. So anyway, this product is Amari and I love the Amari Kids Pack and it has three aspects to it. It has a fundamentals product that um, is the prebiotic and probiotic and really um, supports focus and gut health. Um, then there's the Vita GBX that has vitamins in it and some phytonutrients and amino acid and then the Kids Mood Plus, which is just a different, um, um, you know, herbals that have been shown to um, help support mood. So one thing I love about this product is kind of like an all-in-one. So a lot of times we start like trying a little of this and a little of that. You know, we go to one company for our probiotic. We go to another company for you know, some amino acids and another company for vitamins. And this is all studied as, as a package. And I really like that because I think it allows us to really know that the things are synergistic. And I also love that this product is created by a nutritional biochemist who also is an elite athlete. And they have some great studies as well. So I'm just going to go back here. So the, the link to the website to learn more about this is bit.ly forward slash Dr. Mary capitalized and then gut lowercase because this is more of a therapeutic and deals with the gut brain access. And you technically can do both of these products together. One is truly just whole food and the other one is more of a therapeutic. Um, it doubles up a little bit because it has some phytonutrients in it, but um, you know, it's just like more plants, not a problem. So, now we're going to talk just really briefly about therapeutic diets 
Um, some families who come see me in my clinic, um, they really want a natural approach and they are dedicated and willing to make some nutritional changes to see results. And one thing that a lot of families don't get is like they're, they're trying these therapeutic diets, diets sort of, but that does not really give you much information. So for example, if your child has um, sensitivity to wheat or sensitivity to dairy um, and you just sometimes do wheat or sometimes do dairy, then even just that little amount can kind of throw off the whole trial. So it's really important if you're wanting to know if a diet is worth staying on to be very strict with it for six weeks and see if you see a benefit. So one of the first things, if there are behavioral and mood issues to start with is a gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free diet. And the reason for this is because there can be inflammation at the cellular level that causes kind of a leaky gut situation where things are coming more into the bloodstream and causing irritation even in the brain itself and affecting mood. And also some of the structures, you know, structurally, some of the, you know, the, the milk, the, the breakdown products of milk are similar to opio opioids. And so there can be kind of like a, a feel good effect from these things. And, and that's great for some people, but some kids are very sensitive to like almost like a withdrawal state. And these are some kids who like want to drink tons of milk. And, um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes if you just take those things away, then it just stabilizes their mood so much. If they're one of the people that is more sensitive to this opioid-like effect of, you know, the dairy. So gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free is a good starting point. And then if you feel like, wow, for the six weeks, that made a big difference, then you can choose like, okay, out of those three things, what do I like the most that I want to try adding back? And you can try adding back and see if you still see the difference. And then because I think the goal is to have the least restrictive diet possible. Of course, we want to focus on, you know, low sugar and low additives, low processed foods. But um, in general, when we're talking about things that are generally healthy, then we don't want to be restrictive. And I think that, you know, some people are all about like, oh, milk is bad, wheat is bad. And I am not one of those people. I think if you can eat wheat and you can drink milk and you're okay with soy, as long as you're getting good quality products, um, you know, you're getting non-GMO and things like that, then I think these things are good for most people, but for some kids, it can cause a problem. Another thing to consider, especially if you have a child who has a lot of aggression and like anger management um, or is very agitated, um, kind of buzzing off the walls and things like that, a low salicylate diet can be helpful. And there are salicylates in some healthy foods like berries. Um, but there are also a lot of salicylates in things like red dyes and um, different processed things. So if you take out dyes and additives, then you're cutting out a lot of the salicylates. And you can, you know, for a period, try other fruits besides the high salicylate ones. So you can look online to get an idea of what a low salicylate diet would look like. But that is one area to consider. So, um, another therapeutic diet that can be recommended um, is a low glutamate diet. And um, one therapeutic diet um, that is a, a representation of a low glutamate diet is called the Reed diet. And this um, 
in addition to low glutamate, really advocates, you know, mostly plant-based and healthy fats and proteins and things. Um, but MSG is one of the big, um, you know, suppliers of glutamate. And it's found in a lot of things. Like I was just at the grocery store and looking for some bullion to make soup. And every type of bullion at the store had MSG, at least at the particular store I was at. I know there are some that don't. Um, so I did not buy any because I do not want MSG because glutamate is an inflammatory um, entity that, that can cause brain inflammation. When, like at, just at the, the microscopic level and anytime we have irritation and inflammation, then it affects behavior and mood and regulation. So that is just touching very briefly on therapeutic diets. I have recently been going through this wonderful course called Bioindividual Nutrition through Nourishing Hope. Um, and this is put on by a nutritionist named Julie Matthews who, who specializes in nutritional interventions for ADHD, anxiety, and autism. And so I have loved learning about this and because many of us, we don't need special diets and we can tolerate things, but when we have some things we struggle with, dietary interventions can be one avenue. So I think that is the end of my slides. And if you want to have a call with me following this presentation, uh, you can go to bit.ly forward slash Dr. Mary, all capitalized and then lowercase call. And we can talk a little bit about these options.